Good evening. My name is Pastor Tom, and it's great to be able to have you here with us worshiping our Lord together. We are currently going through a sermon series on the book of James called Faith Works. And the metaphor that we've been using is this idea of a radio and a power outlet. And that's our relationship between faith and works. The only way how we can do good things, the only, thing we can do, the only way how we can do God-pleasing things is if we're first connected through G, to Jesus through faith. But once we're connected to Jesus, the expectation is that we will do good works. And today we are focusing on the idea about how having faith in Jesus will change the way how we talk to other people and the words that we use. So we will now begin our worship service by, uh, with our first hymn, Oh, That I Had a Thousand Voices. It will be led by a soloist, but you are invited to sing along through your mask if you so desire. May God bless our worship. <laughs> Please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children, but we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will.
Let us pray. O Lord, your ears are always open to the prayers of your humble servants who come to you in Jesus' name. Teach us always to ask according to your will that we may never fail to obtain the blessings you have promised. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. In our scripture lessons, we are focusing on the idea of how powerful our words really are. In Proverbs 18, uh, it says that words have power of life and death, just showing how powerful the words we speak really are. The words of the mouth are deep waters, but the fountain of wisdom is a rushing stream. The, lip of, the lips of fools bring them strife, and their mouths invite a beating. The mouths of fools are their undoing, and their lips are a snare to their very lives. The words of a gossip are like choice morsels. They go down to the inmost parts. The name of the Lord is a fortified tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. To answer before listening, that is folly and shame. The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. This is God's word. We now join together in Psalm 119. I will speak the first line, and the congregation is asked to speak the second line. Teach me, O Lord, to follow your decrees. Give me understanding, and I will keep your law. Direct me in the path of your commands. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Fulfill your promises to your servant. How I long for your precepts. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning is now and will be forever. Amen. The verse of the day. Alleluia, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia. 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 Out of respect for the words of Jesus, please stand. Our gospel reading is from John 7, verses 14 through 18. Not until halfway through the festival did Jesus go up to the temple courts and begin to teach. The Jews there were amazed and asked, How did this man get such learning without having been taught? Jesus answered, My teaching is not my own. It comes from the one who sent me. Anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. Whoever speaks on their own does so to gain personal glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is a man of truth. There is nothing false about him. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. We will continue now with our next hymn, Though I May Speak with Bravest Fire.
Our scripture lesson for our meditation this evening comes from James chapter 3. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. This is God's word. I have up here a stack of papers. And you don't need to read it, but uh, do you see how big it is? It's uh, 60 pages long, full of words. 60 pages long, full of words. Uh, students out there, could you imagine if you had a teacher assign you a 60-page essay? That would take forever to write, right? Uh, in my last year at the seminary, I had to write a 50-page paper to graduate, and it took like all year to write down 50 pages for an essay. But do you know that on average, you write a 60-page essay every single day? Well, you don't actually write it, but there are some experts out there that did some studies that's, that say that the amount of words you speak every single day is enough to fill up about a small 60-page book. And maybe you're sitting next to somebody and you're like, well, of course, she doesn't stop talking all day, no problem for her. But I bet there's some skeptical parents out there too. You might live with, or you might be living and thinking about your children and you might say, uh, have you met my teenager before? They pretty much only respond in one word grunts. How are you? Good. I'm hungry. And that, that's all they say. They're not going to fill 60 pages with that. So I understand there's a spectrum between how many pages you might fill with your words. But instead of, instead of thinking about how many words you say and how many pages you fill up, what if you looked at the content of those pages? If we read your 60-page book every day, what kind of things would be in it? Would it be positive and uplifting? Would it be full of encouragement to other people? Would there be goofy stories and dad jokes? Would it be negative and critical? Would parts of it be written in all caps because you yell a lot and get angry a lot? Would there be any lies in your book? Any gossip? Any harsh words, swear words, cuss words? If you read your 60-page book, if you read somebody else's 60-page book, what would you find in it? That's what I want you to think about today, is that the types of words that you use every single day. Because in the section of scripture that we're looking at today, God reminds us about the power of words. The power of words and how can, either encouraging and positive they can be or how destructive they can be. And in James chapter 3, James uses just metaphor after metaphor, picture, all sorts of picture language to describe the power of words. So I want to show you some of those pictures of what he uses uh, in his letter. The first metaphor he uses is that of a horse. You can see two horses there, one on the left that's like a wild stallion. 
Uh, have you ever seen like one of those old Western movies where there's some cowboy and he's going to go pick out his horse and they say, okay, you can pick any horse you want, except for that one. No one can tame that horse. That's the wild stallion. No one can tame it. And why is that? Why do you have one horse that's a wild stallion, that bucking bronco, no one can tame, and you have a more docile horse on the right? What's the difference? Well, one has a bit in its mouth. If a horse has a bit in its mouth, you can control it however you want to. And what's interesting is you have like this 1,000 pound horse, 900 pound horse, I don't know how much horses weigh, but you have a bit in its mouth and you can control it. And the thought behind that with the connection to our words is that your life can really be determined by the things that you say the friendships that you either make or don't make have a lot to do with the words that you say. You might get a job or not get a job based off of your words. So much of the course of your life is determined by the words that you say. And there's a similar thought with the next picture as well, that of a giant ship. Similar idea here, you have this giant ship, so big, weighs so much, but it can be steered with just a small rudder. And the thought behind it is that your whole body, out of your whole body, the tongue is pretty small, but your tongue can get you in a lot of problems or can have a lot of good things happen out of what you say. Your tongue has a big determination on uh, where you go in your life. The next picture is that of a river. And James asked, can a river be a salt, salty river or a freshwater river? Can it be both of those things at once? And the thought is, no, you can't be a freshwater and a saltwater river at the same time. Either you're one or the other. If there's salt in the river, it's a salty river. And the point that he's making there is that you can either use your words to serve and honor God or not. Either your words are God-pleasing or they're not. Either you're using your words to honor God or you're using them to sin. There's no in-between. You're either one or the other. You're either a salty river or a freshwater river. And the next metaphor, the next picture, is that of a fruit tree. And the question James is asking is, this is an orange tree here. Uh, do you think that orange tree can grow apples? Well, no. Orange trees grow oranges. It's not too crazy. An orange tree can't grow apples. And the thought behind that is that, uh, similar to the river, either you are serving God or you're serving the world. Either you are serving God with the words you say or you are serving your sinful nature. There is no in-between. But there's one more metaphor, one more picture that James uses in this section that resonated with me the most this week. And I think it's the most powerful image he uses. It's the picture of a match and a spark of a fire. And James points out that isn't it interesting that just a small spark can create a large fire? This last week, I got to go on vacation with my family. We went down to Tennessee to a cabin in the Smoky Mountains, and we were able to do some hiking with our friends. And while we were hiking, I was talking to one of my friends about how four years ago in Tennessee, there was actually just like this really big forest fire. And what was crazy about it was how that forest fire started. There was a little bit of debate, but for the most part, uh, most people agree that this giant forest fire started with two teenager boys playing with matches. Can you picture that? Two boys walking around going, <laughs> matches, and they throw it on the floor. Most of the time, nothing happened, right? You just you throw it on the pavement, match, match, the fire goes out right away. But they kept playing this game, walking down the path, until they created a giant forest fire. And here's what it looked like. It ended up killing over a dozen people, and it ended up injuring uh, over a couple hundred people, 
and damage so much property. Do you think those goofy teenage boys thought that that would happen? No way, they weren't trying to do that. They just thought playing with a little bit of fire would be fun. But it turned into such a disaster. And the same is true with the words that we use. So often we tell ourselves that the things that we say, they don't really matter. They're not really significant. So often our words can create so many problems. All I said was match. And then she reacted, fire. All I did was say that one joke, match. And then he reacted, fire. All I did was post my opinion about the news on Facebook, match. And then everybody reacted, fire. All I did was say that one thing about that one habit that she has around the house, match. And then she reacted, fire. All I did was comment on, on my coworker's performance at work and how I think he could change a couple things, match. And then he reacted, fire. Have you seen this played out in your own life before? So often the words that we use can impact our relationships, our careers, our friendships, the lives of the people around us. Uh, I think of this um, when I think specifically about married couples. I've been able to do a couple, uh, take a couple uh, engaged couples through pre-marriage counseling since I've been here. And it's a three lesson course for these engaged couples. And out of the three lessons, there's one whole lesson dedicated to communication and how a husband and wife can talk to each other in their marriage. And the reason why one whole lesson is dedicated to communication is because every single couple has problems. Throughout a marriage, every single couple is gonna have some type of problem. They're gonna do something sinful or hurtful to one another. But the key to it is how do you work out those problems? Through communicating. If a couple doesn't know how to communicate, good luck working through your problems, right? And if you don't know how to communicate, you have these small problems and they get bigger and bigger and turn into a giant fire in your marriage. Or think about the workplace for a moment. Have you ever realized how it just takes just one person to ruin the whole atmosphere for the entire place where you work. It just takes one toxic person who makes those sarcastic remarks, those sly comments, and it ruins it for everyone. Maybe it's something that a boss said to you. He says one thing to you, a little nasty, and then all of a sudden, the rest of your night is just ruined. You're laying awake up at night thinking about your job and how you don't want to have to wake up in the morning and go to that job, all because your boss said something mean to you. That's the power of words. That's the power of words, how the things that you say can create giant fires in your life. And as a preacher, it's easy for me to talk about how words can hurt other people, how it can cause problems in your life. But James takes it the next step. Let me show you what he has to say about the fire of our words. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. It's easy to talk about the way how words hurt our relationships, right? But you see what James says here? He says, if you're not careful about the things that you say, you could be heading in the direction of hell. And how can that be? I feel like sins of words, they're the ones that we love to downplay the most. We say, oh, it was just a little white lie. It was just a fib. It was just a goofy joke. It was just telling a story about somebody else. We love to downplay the sins of our words. We love to use them examples as something that's no big deal. 
But you see what James is saying here? That if you're not concerned about the words that you use, you could be heading in the direction of hell. So how can that be? Well, when you see and when you hear the evil words come out of your mouth, that's an indicator of something else. It's an indicator, it's a spiritual thermometer that there is evil also inside your heart. You can see the evil in other people when you see the evil words that they use. You can see the evil inside yourself when you hear those words come out of your mouth. And if you're not concerned with your spiritual thermometer going off, if you're not concerned about hearing the evil come out of your mouth, you need to watch out. You need to be on your guard because you could be in the direction of hell. Jesus Christ, he knew the power of words. When he hung on the cross, he was surrounded by people who insulted him. They made fun of him. He said, oh, you think you're the Savior? Well, you're not looking like a Savior right now, hanging from that cross. They criticized him. They insulted him. And many, many people have been crucified and while they're being crucified, it would make sense that when you're on death row, someone insults you, you insult them back, you're dying, so you might as well use all the curses that you know. But you know what Jesus said while he was cursed? He cried out, Father, forgive them. While Jesus was being insulted, he used his words to cry out a prayer of forgiveness. And when Jesus saw and heard the words that you use, the gossip, the slander, the curse words that you use, you know what Jesus said about those words? On the cross, he cried out, it is finished. And he paid for the forgiveness of all of your sins. For every bad thing you've said, for every bad word you've ever uttered, Jesus forgives it. God used the power of words to create this whole world. And God used the power of words to say it is finished, to give you the forgiveness of sins. That's what we have through Jesus. We have the perfect example of somebody who always used words the correct way. And he used his words powerfully to forgive us our sins. And since we know that, since we know that Jesus has forgiven us all of our sins, how he makes us his child, what types of words do you think we should be putting in this book that you write every single day? Well, I really think there are two different ways of how you can honor God with your words. You can do that by opening your mouth or closing your mouth. Sometimes some of you might need to hear the message that you need to open your mouth more. You need to open your mouth more to encourage other people, to compliment other people, to build people up with love. Use your words in powerful ways that way. Maybe it comes in the form of thinking of one person this week that you could call on the phone, someone who you think might be feeling lonely during this quarantine. Call them up, build them up. Use the power of words and encourage that person. And the other side is true, too. There are some people in this room that need to hear that sometimes it's God-pleasing to close your mouth, to not say that joke, to not use those dirty words, to not tell gossip, to not tell lies. Sometimes it's God-pleasing to open our mouth, and sometimes it's God-pleasing to shut up. I was excited to write that sentence, to tell you guys that sometimes you can serve the Lord by shutting up. But it's true. I can live like that. I, I've noticed that in my life. There are times I need to speak up more. There's times where I just need to be quiet and listen, to listen to what other people have to say, to show them love that way. Because every single day, you're writing a book. You're writing a book with the words that you use. 
So think about that. Consider that. And when you see your Savior and how he used words and how he used words to forgive you, that will lead us to use our words to serve him. We do this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand. We now join in confessing the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. At this time to reflect our thanks to God, we will collect an offering. Uh, even though we can't do that in person, passing around a plate, we do have an offering basket in the back for when you leave, or you can go to holytrinitynewhope.org slash donate and give an electronic offering there. Thank you so much for supporting our mission of sharing Jesus Christ with all ages and nations. At this time, I invite Brett and Adrian Bangle to come forward. Dear Brett and Adrian, Holy Trinity Lutheran Church has called you to serve as teachers. You have been prepared for this ministry by careful instruction in the word of God so that you carry out your duties in conformity with that word. As an ambassador of Christ, you are to teach the pure doctrine of God's word, to instruct the young in the way of salvation, and to always have in your heart the spiritual warfare, welfare of every soul under your care. You are to devote yourselves to the meditation and study of scriptures. You and your family are to be an example to others in godliness and Christian living, putting no stumbling block in anyone's path so that the ministry will not be discredited. You are to speak the truth in love, as the Apostle Peter reminds us, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and power forever and ever. The ability to carry out this calling is not in us, but comes from God. As St. Paul reminded the Corinthian Christians, not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. The Holy Spirit, who himself has called you to this ministry, will be with you. In keeping with the word and the will of the Lord, you are about to be teachers at Holy Trinity. I ask you, in the presence of God in this congregation, are you fully determined to carry out this work according to the grace which God will give? If so, answer, I am. Do you believe that the canonical books of the Old and New Testament are the inspired word of God, and the only infallible rule of faith and practice? If so, answer, I do. I do. Do you accept the three ecumenical creeds, the Apostles, the Nicene, and the Athanasian, as faithful testimonies to the truth of the Holy Scriptures? And do you reject all the errors which they condemn? If so, answer, I do. I do. Do you solemnly promise that all your teaching will conform to the Holy Scriptures and to the Lutheran confessions? If so, answer, I do. Will you give faithful witness to Christ in the world that God's love may be known in all that you do and say? If so, answer, I will, and I ask God to help me. I will, and I ask God to help me. Almighty God, who has given you the will to do these things, will graciously give you the strength and compassion to perform them. Now to Holy Trinity and the congregation. I now ask you in the presence of God, are you willing to receive them as servants of Christ, 
Will you show them love and honor and support them with your gifts and prayer? If so, answer, we will, and we ask God to help us. Brett and Adrian, I install you as teachers at Holy Trinity in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. May the Lord pour out on you his Holy Spirit for the work committed to you that you may faithfully proclaim the gospel. You may now go back to your seats. Please stand for prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for leading Brett and Adrian to come to Holy Trinity. I ask that you may give them the will and desire and strength to carry out the task that you've laid before them. I ask that you may use them to share the gospel with those in our community and to be good examples of them and let their light shine. Dear Lord, I also pray for everyone in this congregation that they may better understand the power of words. I ask that you may fill us with your love that we may uh, use our words to serve you by encouraging other people and building others up in your name. We pray this all in your name and join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated. Well, once again, good evening and welcome to all of you. Uh, It was great to be able to worship the Lord together. The only real announcement I have is an official welcome to the Bangle family. Brett is our new principal at Holy Trinity, and him and his wife are going to co-teach third and fourth grade together, and they also have a third grader and a fourth grader. So their whole family is taking over the third and fourth grade classroom this year, Uh, but let's welcome them with a round of applause. Normally when we have new called workers, we like to have some sort of party or fellowship hour, but because of COVID, we can't do all that. So in your bulletin, uh, I have their email addresses and their home address. If you'd like to send them an email welcoming them or send them a card to their house, or you can you know, talk to them from six feet away after church. Uh, that's all the announcements that I have. May God bless the rest of your week.